Hello and welcome to our lecture series on the nervous system. My name is Ruth Fabian Fine. I'm a professor of biology and neuroscience here at St. Michael's College in Colchester, Vermont. The first lecture in this series is concerned with the functional anatomy of neurons. First of all, I would like to introduce the nervous system to you. The nervous system is uh, composed out of two major subunits. The first one is called the central nervous system, abbreviated CNS. And the second one is called the peripheral nervous system, abbreviated PNS. As you can see in this picture here, the central nervous system consists out of the brain and out of the spine, everything that is indicated in this picture in blue. The peripheral nervous system consists out of all the extensions and the um, nerves that come out of the central nervous system or project into the nervous the central nervous system. And for that reason, the, the neurons in the peripheral nervous system and in the central nervous system have different terminology. So they are roughly subdivided in afferent neurons and efferent neurons. And the difference between afferent and efferent neurons is that afferent neurons send information to the central nervous system, such as sensory neurons that are incorporated in our skin. So if we are sensitive to touch, we feel that. This information is transmitted to the central nervous system through so-called afferent or ascending neurons. Information that comes down from our central nervous system, for, for example, if you want to initiate movement, it comes from your central nervous system, it is sent down your, to your spine, then synapses or it contacts onto motor neurons, and this information is sent out from the central nervous system, and this is um, what efferent neurons do. So they send information from the central nervous system into the periphery, so efferent or descending neurons. Um, the, and the nervous system consists out of uh, many uh, individual neurons, and it, it depends on what type of organism it is. Um, the uh, mammalian brain consists out of billions of, of neurons. Smaller organisms, uh, like invertebrate organisms, only have uh, about a thousand neurons. So there's a wide variety of neurons within different uh, nervous systems. But neurons in general are formed in invertebrates and lower organisms, very similar to uh, vertebrates and mammalian organisms. They consist out of a soma, or cell body, and then they have all these uh, extensions that are protruding out of the cell body, and they are subdivided. They are called the so-called neurites, and these neurites can be subdivided into either dendrites or axons. Each neuron, and it depends on what type of neuron it is, in general has a dendrite and, uh, or dendrites and an axon that come out of it. And uh, there are exceptions, there are neurons that don't have axons, but in general most neurons do have axons and have dendrites. Um, as you can see in this picture here, um, it is possible that some neurons have a number of dendrites protruding out of the cell body but there's in general always only one axon that comes out of each neuron. These axons can have, um, can branch uh, later on as they've uh, uh, protruded out of the soma, and these branches are called axon collaterals. And these axon collaterals can either project in the same direction, the same area as the main axon projects into, or contacts into, or they can branch out and contact different areas, completely different areas, for example, in the brain. And we'll talk about the significance of this later on in this lecture series. As you can see in this picture here, the dendrites in some cases have very specific um, um, extensions here, and these are called spines. And these spines are usually receiving synaptic input. So for that reason, the dendrites are usually postsynaptic. So they receive synaptic input. So they are the receiving element. Whereas the axons, and you can see this in an example here, or in an example here, where one neuron makes an axon and contacts with this axon, the soma of this neuron here. 
So the axons are usually presynaptic. They form synaptic contacts onto postsynaptic cells. Um, the axons of neurons are usually, in, particularly in the mammalian central and peripheral nervous system, insulated by glial cells. Um, Glial cells are supporting cells in the nervous system, so the nervous system consists out of neurons and out of glial cells, and in fact, the majority of cells in the nervous system are glial cells. And glial cells um, have a number of different functions. They insulate the axons, as you can see in this uh, picture here, in order to enable those uh, neurons to um, have a faster signal transduction. And we'll talk about the significance of this uh, velocity of signal transduction in the third lecture when we talk about action potentials and the velocity of signal transduction. So this insulation, is, you can compare this very much with the plastic insulation around an electric wire. Insulates this neuron, and so the current within the neuron can uh, travel much faster than compared to uh, neurons that are not insulated. There are two different types of glial cells that surround the axons in the mammalian uh, central and peripheral nervous system. They are the so-called oligodendrocytes, and they insulate the axons in the central nervous system of mammalians. The Schwann cells insulate the axons in the peripheral nervous system of mammalians. And you can see this here in a little bit more detail. So you see those glial cells, and this is the nucleus of one of those glial cells. In this case, it's in the central nervous system, and it is an oligodendrocyte. So these oligodendrocytes wrap themselves around the axon of the neuron. <clears throat> and wherever one oligodendrocyte ends and the next oligodendrocyte starts, we have this little gap. And this little gap is called the node of Bronvier. And what happens in this little gap here is <clears throat> that the signal, the action potential that is conducted along the axon can be regenerated in these areas due to special receptors or ion channels that are located within these, the membrane of those gaps. And we will talk about this in more detail <coughs> In lecture number three. Again, <clears throat> here if we look at the soma of this neuron, here the axon is coming out of the soma, and you can see here that here is a uh, the uh, glial cell that insulates this axon, and this little part of this uh, axon here that is immediately adjacent to the soma <clears throat> and forms this initial axon segment is also called the axon hillock. And the axon hillock plays a very important role in the generation of action potentials in neurons. <clears throat> so because glial cells are so critically important in the nervous system as well, I just would like to mention a little bit about glial cells. Glial cells have a number of very important functions in the nervous system. <clears throat> For example, guidance of neurons during early development. When neurons, when the nervous system grows out, neurons have to find their path at where they innervate, which organ they innervate, and where they migrate. There are um, concentration gradients that play a role in this, but also glial cells. And these glial cells are the so-called radial glial cells. Then, as we just mentioned, they play an important role in the insulation of axons and in the uh, velocity of the uh, transduction of the action potential along the axon of the neurons. And these are the, either the Schwann cells or the oligodendrocytes. Then they are generally supporting structures in order to maintain the integrity of the nervous system and the uh, shape of the nervous system. So there um, are particularly astrocytes that are important for this. Then they help to control the extracellular environment. So neurons this are cells, and they have a very uh, um, important intracellular uh, concentration um, of molecules and, and ions. 
that are very important to be, uh, be maintained within the cell. In order to make sure that all of these ions and, and, uh, and molecules are being put back into the cell and that the extracellular space is uh, maintained as its gradient, glial cells play a very important role in helping with this. And these are the astrocytes as well. Then the formation of the blood brain barrier is very important in order to prevent uh, unwanted substances to get into the brain. Um, astrocytes play an important role here as well. And then finally, the removal of waste products and repair mechanisms when neurons degenerate or when metabolic end products need to be removed. There are um, microglia that play an important role that take up the debris and metabolize or discard of the debris. Um, we uh, subdivide neurons based on their uh, appearance into different types of neurons. This, for example, is a unipolar neuron. What you see here is just one uh, neurite. And this neurite uh, has uh, just off the neurite uh, the soma. And for that reason, it is called unipolar because you have just one neurite that is uh, usually sensory neurons in the mammalian system have this shape. Then there are bipolar neurons, and this is an example for a bipolar neuron, and as you can see, in contrast to this one here, you have the soma of the neuron, you have the axon, and you have the dendrite uh, protruding out of the soma in opposite areas. So in particular, invertebrate systems have a lot of those bipolar neurons. One neurite would be the dendrite, and the other neurite is the axon. And then we have the multipolar neurons, and what you can see here is that we have one soma, and out of the soma you have a, a number of dendrites that protrude out of this uh, soma, and always one axon that comes out of it. These multipolar neurons are very abundant in the uh, cortex uh, of mammalians. With regard to signal transduction in neurons, so we said that the dendrites, so these here are the dendrites of this neuron, here's the soma, this is the axon, here are glial cells, and these are the axon terminals. And the signal transduction, the way how neurons send their signal from one cell to the next cell is always in one direction. And this is from the soma as indicated here. So here we have synapses that send synaptic input onto this dendrite here. And you can see, indicated by those red arrows here, the signal is now transacted from the soma, from the dendrites first, via the soma, through the axon, to the axon terminals, and then contacts in a variety of different cells. Um, these might be neurons, these might be muscles, these might be gland cells, these might be blood vessels that can be innervated by neurons. The signal never is conducted in this direction. It is always from the soma to the axon terminal. There are different types of synapses that those axons form. So here this is an, a synapse. So the signal that this neuron here generates is now conducted along the axon to the axon terminal, and here it forms a synapse. And there are different types of synapse. One type is the electrical synapse. The electrical synapse has forms so-called gap junctions. And these are basically pores or channels between two neurons. So this one here is one neuron, the, the end of one neuron, higher magnified. This one here is the beginning of the other neuron, higher magnified. So these are the membranes of the neurons. And what you can see here is that there are ion channels incorporated into the membrane of the postsynaptic neuron and into the membrane of the presynaptic neuron. And here you can see that those ion channels directly allow ions to flow through. And these are the so-called gap junctions or electrical synapses. And they consist of proteins. And those proteins, and it's indicated here, consists of a number of uh, subunits, protein subunits, the so-called connexins, 
and six connections make up one connection, and two connections make up one gap junction channel. These are the electrical synapses, and electrical synapses are very important for very fast and uh, coordinated movement or uh, signaling within nervous tissue or muscle tissue. And then the more abundant synapses are the chemical synapses. And chemical synapses, as you can see here, are formed at the end of an axon terminal. So here's our axon that comes from this neuron here and projects an axon terminal on this postsynaptic dendrite of this uh, neuron here. And as you can see, there are a number of organelles in this synaptic terminal, and we'll talk about more. Of, uh, we'll talk more about those organelles in the next part. And there are synaptic vesicles, and they contain neurotransmitters. And these neurotransmitters are released here in the synaptic cleft, and then. This here's the synaptic cleft. You see this little gap between the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron. And in the postsynaptic neuron, in the membrane of the postsynaptic neuron, there are receptors, and the neurotransmitters will bind to those receptors and then initiate a response that leads to the activation of the postsynaptic neuron. So this is called a chemical synapse. And these chemical synapses can contain a number of different neurotransmitters. And these are the neuroactive chemicals that are stored in those little synaptic vesicles in the presynaptic terminal. The most prominent uh, uh, neurotransmitters uh, in the human body are acetylcholine. And if a neuron releases acetylcholine, it is called a cholinergic neuron. Glutamate and uh, gamma aminobutyric acid, or GABA. So cholinergic, or acetylcholine, is mainly released at our neuromuscular junction. So if we want to move our muscle, the transmitter that is released by the motor neurons onto the muscle is mainly acetylcholine. Glutamate is the main activating neurotransmitter in the mammalian brain. And GABA is the main inhibiting or in inactivating neurotransmitter in the mammalian brain. And as you can see in this image here, depending on, so these are uh, vesicles in one of those synapses, and they're very highly magnified with an electron microscope. And as you can see here, these are these vesicles that are in the synapses, located in the synapses. And you can see that there are different types of vesicles. And these different types of vesicles contain different neurotransmitters. And as you can see in this picture here, each synapse may contain not just one neurotransmitter, but a number of different neurotransmitters. For example, the, these uh, uh, vesicles here that sh look so dark, and they're so-called electron-dense vesicles, they are known to contain transmitters that are neuropeptides. Whereas uh, acetylcholine, glutamate, and GABA are stored in little vesicles that are round and electron-lucent. And you can label for these transmitters in with uh, fluorescent molecules. So you can, for example, tag GABAergic vesicles with a green um, dye you can tag glutamatergic vesicles with a red dye, and you can then identify where those GABAergic and glutamatergic neurons in the nervous system are. This is just a little bit about the methodology and more modern methodology in the nervous system and in neuroscience. In the next part of this lecture, we will talk a little bit more about the cell components of the neurons in the